So tonight we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4, finishing up. Now, I have found in studying that when you get to the last chapter of a book, even a book of the Bible, you kind of rush through it. In other words, after you've read and studied so many different things, you're kind of ready to be done when you get to the end of it. And Normally, Paul's letters, the, the last chapter is a salutation anyway where he's saying, you know, say hi to so-and-so, let every, you know, do this, that, and the other. But still, uh, there's a lot of important information that's in there. But still, it'll be a little shorter than some of the other ones. So Colossians chapter 4, start out here in verse 1. It says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Now, we see this over and over again, a common theme in Paul's letters where he's making, making special note that we all have the same master. Uh, he says it in Colossians 3, which we covered the last time, that knowing, that knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, even said the same thing in Matthew 23, 8. He says, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye all are brethren. So though we all have different uh, functions, we have uh, different personalities, we have different places that we are in life, uh, if we are born again, we are all serving the same master and we're all brethren. But when he says to give to your servants that which is just and equal, it means to treat and to pay them fairly. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving everybody 15 or $20. That's working a traditionally minimum wage job. But it does mean to pay people what they're worth. We see that in Scripture as well. And there's actually uh, like Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Luke, Mark, uh, where he says the servant is worthy of his hire. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Verse 2 says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, Romans 12 in 12, it says it like this. It says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Prayer is not so much a singular event. It is a lifestyle. It is a heart that is bent on communion with God. Now, there are those that pray longer and seem to have a more heartfelt uh, approach to prayer. And then there are others that pray more like myself where it's, uh, you know, thank you, Lord, for the food. And, you know, we just uh, say what we got to say and we're on with it. Uh, so it's not something that's prescribed or that is formulaic. Everyone does pray a little bit different. It's not just a singular prayer time. It's an attitude and a heart that we have towards God. You know, it's not something that we do for show. It's not something that we do in vain repetition. Uh, you know, Jesus speaks of that several times, you know, to not be like the, like the pagans, you know, just like chants and rants and, and different things. And it doesn't have to be like a TV preacher that's singing every other word. And you don't have to yell because my, as my aunt was very fond of saying, God is not deaf. Uh, if, you, if you pray a little loud, that's fine. But if you don't, that's also fine as well. So verse 3. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I, I am also in bonds. And Paul prayed for that quite often in Ephesians. He says the same thing, that he was asking the church there at Ephesus to pray for him that utterance may be given to him to open his mouth boldly for the mystery of the gospel. That even the great apostle Paul, even the greatest preachers and teachers that we hear from and that we see, they all need a little of that unction and boldness from God. And when we talk about the mystery of Christ, I know during the first chapter of Colossians, we talked about the seven different type of mysteries that are in Scripture, like the mystery of godliness, the mystery of Christ in you, the indwelling Christ, the mystery of the church, the mystery of the restoration of Israel, the mystery of the rapture of the church, the mystery of Babylon the Great, and the mystery of iniquity, also the Antichrist. So uh, all of this is connected in one way or another. So we'll go on to verse 4. It says, that I, may, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. If you make something manifest, that means to make it plain, to make it open and not difficult to understand or obscure. 
A friend of mine has told me that you cannot be too plain when you're describing something to someone. And most of the misunderstandings we have with people is that we're just not very plain as far as what our stance is, what we're seeking, and what we expect. So it's never a bad idea to be extremely plain, just not rude. And that's why I do not use the King James Version. Okay. Because it is not plain, and I need it spelled out plain and simple. You need it explained out simple. I would much rather know that manifest meant known than me have to get a dictionary and keep looking at all these words. Okay. But you know, if you go through the dictionary the first time or two, then you don't have to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Now, Ephesians 5, 16 says the same thing, Re redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you're redeeming something, it's purchasing it back, ransoming it. Uh, taking back ownership of something maybe you previously had and is gone. Especially in ancient Israel, they would redeem their land. They would redeem the title that they had on their belongings that either to, either because of financial distress or one thing or the other, that the, the family farm was now owned by somebody else. But they could redeem that from them and it was theirs again. So he's telling us here to redeem our time, to take back ownership of our time and our lives. And how does God ransom us back? You know, he doesn't do it just by eternal decree or uh, some sort of set of principles or anything else. He does it in the blood of his son. 1 Timothy 2, and we'll start here at, we'll start at 3. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and here it is, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So the way God ransomed us back, brought us back and took back ownership of us was in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He paid for us in his own blood. Verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, I read that salt is, when it's used in Scripture, it can kind of allude to wisdom or grace. Uh, and it's, of course, some, salt is something that preserves. It's a symbol of purity as well. And at least at this time, it was something that was expensive. As some of you may have read that the Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt. You know, I can't imagine being paid in salt now. It's, you know, for the most part, it's fairly worthless. But it's some, it, sometimes in the ancient world, it was something of value. Now, you notice that it says here that her speech, let it be with grace, seasoned with salt. My youngest daughter told me one time that I was actually salty. So not that my words were seasoned with salt, but that I was salty. So I had to go and look it up because I've gotten to the age now where I don't understand a lot of slang that people say, and I want to make sure before I tell someone else that it's not something dirty. And if you look it up in the Urban Dictionary, it's a term, salty, that originates from the Navy. And they, were used, they use that to describe disgruntled older officers. <laughs> And it goes further still because apparently someone takes all the time to write these things down. In the Oxford English Dictionary, it's a slang word that means angry, irritated, or hostile. So my youngest daughter just got one over on me by telling me that I was salty, but I did went and look it up. And I applauded her for her choice use, use of words. So all my state, this is verse 7, all my state shall Tychius declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now, throughout Paul's epistles, you see fellow prisoner, fellow, fellow laborer, fellow worker, fellow servant, fellow soldier, speaking of that community that we all have, and we already mentioned that earlier about serving the same master, and that we're all brethren in one sense or another. Even, even the angels have a certain sense of brotherhood within themselves and with believers. In the book of Revelation, where John fell down to worship at the angel's feet, he said, See that thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. 
and of thy brethren the prophets that are them which keep the sayings of this book worship God. So the angels themselves do not seek worship. They point back to their master who is ours as well. Verse 8. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. So the man that Paul had sent to him was doing a little bit of reconnaissance work. You know, you can hear about people just like today. You can read on social media. You can read about text, but you never really know someone's situation, someone's estate, someone's state of affairs until you get to know them and you're there personally. You know, everything's, everything sounds good on social media. And if you take the selfies in the right way, everything looks good. But the reality of it may be something far darker and far more uh, in, in need of attention. And so he, that's what he did here, sent his own personal delegation to kind of check it out. Now, verse 9, it says, one with Onesimus, I had to look that up today to pronounce it correctly, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, and shall make known unto you all the things which are done here. Now, this name, other than just being difficult to pronounce with modern vernacular, Onesimus means profitable or useful. His very name means someone that is profitable or useful. Now, he was not always looked at as somebody that was profitable or useful. Now, the book of Philemon, which is just one single, one single chapter, is actually connected very closely to the book of Colossians. Because this man here, Onesimus, after robbing his master, which his master was Philemon, he ran away with all the belongings, all the money that he stole, and he was imprisoned. Now, when he was imprisoned, his cellmate happened to be the Apostle Paul. So the man was converted, and after he was released, Paul sent him back to his master. With uh, just a little letter, you know, to kind of smooth things over, and I'll read you just a couple of, a couple of it here. And you start at uh, verse 10 in Philemon, it says, you know, I beseech thee for my son, uh, Onesimus, whom I have, forgot, have begotten in my bonds which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, therefore receive him, that is my, in my own bowels, talking about his innermost, uh, innermost being, not a, you know, some sort of a GI problem. Uh, and he also tells him down here at the end, this is around verse 16, he tells him that when he receives him back, but not to do so as a servant, but as a brother beloved, especially to me, and to him as well. And it said to count him as a partner as Paul counted him himself. And he gets this right here at verse 18. He says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put it on my account. So it's a picture of the gospel message right there because Paul tells, Paul tells Philemon, if this servant owes you anything, if he's in any sort of debt when he returns to you, I'll pay it myself. He was ransoming him back if need be. And if you read the whole letter, he does uh, lay it on him a little bit thicker than that, so he feels a little more obligated in order to receive him well. But that same slave that had robbed his master, ran away, and then was imprisoned with Paul, actually took the letter to the church at Colossae. So this letter here, so apparently it did go well when he met back up with him, because the letter survived. Uh, and you can see how someone that was, as he said, unprofitable, useless, a vagabond and a fugitive at one time was used to carry one of the most important books of the Bible to someone else. And so that's a story. All of us have varying stories, but at one time we were quite unprofitable. Uh, not only maybe you could even say useless, but enemies of God that God has used us for other things and greater things than we'd ever thought possible. So verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas, touching whom you have received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. So when he says circumcision, he's talking about the Jews. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. 
Now, Epaphras was also mentioned in Philemon as well. And during both of the letter to the church at Colossae, the letter to Philemon, you'll see a lot of the same names because at this particular point in time, anyway, they were running buddies. Uh, everyone knew each other. Verse 13, it says, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and to them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. To have a zeal for anything is to have a passionate ardor in the pursuit of anything. Uh, it's an eagerness or a desire to accomplish something. And we see in Matthew 10, 4, and when you go through all the listing of the, of the apostles, uh, I've heard him called Simon the Zealot. Uh, but it was actually Simon the Canaanite, which it, Zealot uh, was kind of how the Canaanites were referred to quite often. Uh, that he was a man of passion, a man of initiative, and actually, uh, from what I have read about him, they think that he may have been part of some sort of guerrilla group back, back in uh, first century Israel to strike back at the Romans that had taken over Israel at that time. In verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now, I wanted to focus just a little bit on this one gentleman here, his name Demas. He's also mentioned in Philemon, and he's also mentioned in 2 Timothy. Now, the book of Colossians and the book of Philemon roughly was written around 60 or 61 AD, still fairly early in the ministry of Paul. Now, the other letter that I mentioned, 2 Timothy, was right at the end of his life, right around 67 AD. So we have this man mentioned here, Demas. Demas greets you, he sends his greetings. He's also spoken of very well in Philemon, which is written around the same time. But in short seven years later, this is what is said about him. This is 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. So within seven years, a brother that was beloved, a fellow laborer, a fellow minister, had forsaken the Apostle Paul. Now, I was pointing that out to say this, don't be a Demas. Don't be someone that starts out so well, and most of us do start out well. We start out bold, we start out passionate, but then the cares of, the life, of our life come in. Uh, we get tired, we get bored, and we just fall away. Everyone starts out well, but very few finish well. You know, Paul even spoke about that in Galatians 5, 7. It says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So that's something I think that we should all strive for and be mindful of, that at the close of our life, that people can say that we ran well and ran consistently instead of starting out well, starting out hard, and then falling away by the wayside. So verse 15 Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house, which is where most churches were gathering at the time. And when this epistle, verse 16, is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, there is no epistle to the church at Laodicea. I did a little bit of digging on it, and it's generally regarded one or two ways, that there is or was an epistle to the church at Laodicea, but it is lost to history. Uh, some ancient sources, sources like Hippolytus, which was around, I think, the third or fourth century, uh, he said that it was basically the letter to the Ephesians that Paul just sent on to uh, the church at Laodicea. Since he wrote this letter and he says here, so read it in this church, read it in this church, it was generally understood that it was going to be passed around. It was the, the blog post of the day. In verse 17, And to Archibus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. If you're going to fulfill anything, it's to render it full, complete, to bring it to its completion. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill, to bring it to its completion and to its end, to fulfill the obligations of the law. Verse 18, we're almost done. Everybody stay with me. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, 
Grace be with you. Amen. That means it was written by him himself and not a scribe, at least the salutation. And as you, as some of you may have know, it was, uh, or may have, may have read, Paul is said to have had very bad eyesight, especially towards the end of his life. Uh, for instance, when he writes out the salutations in Galatians 6.11, he says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. So when he was taking the time and had to write things himself, his letters were big, maybe not as neat. Uh, vernacular was a little bit different, and that's why you'll see a little bit of a difference in some of the language when you have a scribe versus him doing it himself. So, like I said, I know it's short, especially compared to the other chapters, and since it's a goodbye chapter, basically, uh, it's something that's easy to pass over, but I think there's several things in here that are very important, especially the part about Demas that we can all learn from and take a special note of that it's not something that we want to be like. <laughs> don't be a Demas and don't have that recorded about you for all of eternity because his failure and his abandonment of the Apostle Paul uh, now stands as a record uh, for all of eternity to be remembered. And there's no epistle that bears his name where they could have been. Okay, well, let's pray then. Father, we thank you for the word of God that you kept for us. Father, we're thankful for each other and that we have this opportunity to meet. And more than that, Lord, we're thankful for what you've done for us in your son, sending him to pay the price for our ransom, to redeem us, to deliver us from this world and from our sins. Father, we thank you that you've been so faithful to us and that you are continuing to be faithful to us, even when we are faithless and we ourselves are weak. Lord, we thank you that we've had this time. We look forward to being, being here again. We love you. Amen. Amen.